Uh, and thank you. Thank you everyone to, uh, for, for coming to the seminar. Um, so um, as Paolo was just saying, so I, uh, 25 years ago, I was a lecturer uh, in this department at, uh, at UCL and also simultaneously a lecturer in the neuroscience department. And I think I was the first sort of uh, inter interdepartmental sort of lecturer. Um, I, uh, I left um, uh, UCL to, uh, um, uh, to start a few companies um, with actually UCL students. Um, and uh, in fact, I used to say, and I still say sometimes at conferences, uh, if you have really good students, they employ you. Um, so I went, um, uh, so, the, the, so after these, these companies, I'll tell you a little bit about them because they're relevant to the, to the finance background. But what I want to do in the, in, the, in the lecture today is in the seminar is to talk a little bit about uh, transitions and the uh, background about what's happening in the um, uh, in finance and how data and some of these new methods are going to create a I think a a a, a new creation uh, uh, of uh, of uh, methods and techniques for uh, investing. So uh, using uh, using data and combining uh, traditional sort of quant uh, methods with uh, traditional discretionary methods, which I'll talk a little bit about. But let me go back to the background. So I left uh, UCL, and the first company was uh, called SurgeSpace. It's one of the most successful startups out of the, the the out of UCL, and came out of the computer science department. And we were doing um, uh, looking for white collar crime in um, uh, in uh, bank transactions and. and Company had a successful exit. Uh, had, at that point in 2005, we had uh, 18 of the top 25 banks as clients, and we sold the business to Walbert Pincus. Um, I helped that transition. And then, with some other UCL students, we started a company called Quantcast, which was one of the first movers in um, ad tech, providing personalized ads, um, which now everyone experiences online of these ads that follow you around the internet. Uh, so, Quantcast was one of the first movers in that space. Um, uh, again, um, UCL grads um, and uh, that company had grown. So our first product was in 2009. By 2014, the company had grown to $400 million a year in revenue, uh, about 1,000 people. I was running engineering when I was recruited um, by Steve Cohen to uh, uh, set up a data science unit and be the first chief data scientist at Point72. So Point72 used to be they see capital. Uh, Steve Cohen has been made famous by writing the largest compliance check in history. Um, uh, for uh, insider trading, $1.6 billion. Um, uh, and uh, also he's the owner of the Mets, the baseball team, and so uh, was made famous also by the Showtime program called Billions. So I was the first chief data scientist there. And then I went to GIC, the Singapore Sovereign Wealth Fund, and I was their first chief data scientist. And then the last four years, I was the first chief data scientist at Neuberger Berman. So I spent the last um, nearly a decade in the finance industry um, using these methods. But let me just first explain why would Steve Cohen hire me to actually go create a data science team? And it's very, quite simple because um, the ad tech uh, industry uh, developed a whole set of methods, computing, uh, machine learning, um, and uh, analysis methods that allow them uh, to decide what ad to show you by analyzing this really messy unstructured data like your visit graph across the internet. So if I know what ad to show you, uh, I know what product you're interested in. If I know that across all products, geographies, and services, then I know which companies actually are winning in the marketplace um, because they have the most interest. And so if I know which companies are winning in the marketplace, well, I could either use that information to uh, sell ads or I could use that information to buy companies. So it's exactly the same processing, exactly the same tech stack that, that came out of the uh, ad tech space in the internet space is now being brought into um, the uh, finance industry. And so, so let me talk a little bit about the finance industry. So, you know, an academic comes into the finance industry and, you know, you, you know with some academic back, background, you sort of, you bring in, you know, a lot of the other academic literature, like, you know, efficient markets. And so, um, so let me just talk a moment about uh, efficient markets. And so I'm sure you all are familiar with efficient markets. I like the joke version. It's easier to remember. The joke version of efficient markets is um, uh, um, Eugene Fama, who won the Nobel Prize for efficient markets. Professor Fama is walking down the road with another economist. The other economist says to him, uh, look, Professor Fama, there's $50 on the road. Professor Fama says, it must be counterfeit or someone else would have picked it up. So the basic idea is that there's no opportunity in the market. I'm not even going to look at the $50 because I have to assume that it's just worthless. So no opportunities occur in the market at all. So that's sort of the efficient markets perspective. So when I went into the finance industry, um, what we were doing um, is um, 
uh, analyzing data to forecast uh, events, uh, so-called earning surprise. So as everyone in the room probably knows, um, once a quarter um, in most parts of the world, um, every public company uh, tells you how they're doing. They give you high level information about um, uh, the health of the company. So top line revenue, total revenue they made, some earnings per share, uh, and perhaps some guidance about how the, things are gonna go the next quarter. So when companies announce their earnings, which is usually about you know, four to six weeks after the end of the quarter, um, the, uh, that's the largest liquidity point um, in any stock. So you would have lots of shares uh, changing hands um, as you learn exactly how the company is doing. And not only that, there are uh, usually for most companies, the largest swings in the price of the stock occur at this point uh, of earning surprise. So you ask yourself the question, um, how can the markets be efficient if every single time they report earnings we're surprised? So if the market really knows um, the value of all these companies, then we shouldn't be surprised. In fact, if you simply ask yourself, what's the sum of the absolute value of the earnings surprise in some particular sector? You could take that as, a, as an initial measure of information that's not in the market. Um, and, uh, and in fact, then if you Venn diagram that with data that's in the world, then that essentially tells you where the opportunity is. So, um, so if you have uh, lots of data in the world and the data isn't in the market, um, then, then, then uh, it's, the market's not efficient yet. And so it's not priced in. So let me get, just give you a concrete example. Um, in uh, 2017, uh, beginning of the year, um, uh, uh, Tim Cook announced at a conference that, um, that Apple hadn't done as well as they thought it they would have uh, in China and selling, selling iPhones. So it turned out it was the first uh, negative growth quarter for uh, Apple in um, more than 15 years. And uh, at that, on that day, uh, uh, $70 billion was wiped off the, the uh, market cap, the value of Apple. Now, $70 billion is a large number compared to the market cap of any stock. And Apple is, uh, is one of, if not the most followed stock with most analysts analyzing the stock. And clearly the market didn't realize that Apple wasn't selling as many iPhones as they thought in China and that they weren't gonna have as good a quarter as everyone was thinking, uh, or they wouldn't have had such a big surprise movement uh, in the negative direction. But every one of those phones that is sold or not sold, I mean, the ones that are sold, uh, use um, uh, social media. They have a contract, the, they use, the, they use uh, it, it as a phone. They basically, um, and so they're downloading apps. And so the data about how many phones exist in the world clearly exists. The data is out there. It's just that the finance industry doesn't have access to that data. And so everyone's surprised. So the point is that the data are in the world, um, uh, but the data are not priced into the market. So, um, so, so let's just talk a little bit before we dive into some examples. Let's talk a little bit about um, uh, the ecosystem of, of finance. And again, many people in the room will know a lot about this ecosystem, but, but let me just, so that we can actually add on it, make, put it, bring us all to the same page in terms of this ecosystem. So, so first there were fundamental investors. Um, and uh, fundamental investors uh, have sort of a finance, accounting, networking background. And what they do is they analyze the health of companies and uh, in order to determine the value of a company. And again, I, I, the best analogy is someone who values properties. So if you want to buy a property or you want to know the value of your property, you might go to a valuation expert. They look at some comparable properties. They do some spreadsheet work. They give you a nice color report that tells you the value of your property. Similarly, these valuation fundamental investors evaluate uh, uh, companies. So they know a very large amount, usually about a small number of companies in one particular sector. So I describe them as an inch wide and a mile deep. Um, along about uh, 20, 30 years ago uh, uh, came the, the first uh, inklings of quant investing. And so quants um, do mostly signal processing on, uh, on uh, price change data in many cases. They bring in other things that features into their model, but, but largely it's signal processing across the entire investable universe with lots of small bets. Um, and so they really know nothing about the businesses. So you can think of them as an inch deep and a mile wide. And so we have you know, uh, one group, which is an, an inch wide and a mile deep, um, and uh, the other one, which is an inch deep and a mile wide. And so 
uh, that what's happening is there's a movement to the middle and movement to the middle is driven a little bit by these, this uh, 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 data, and which I'm going to get into. But, um, uh, but let me back up first and, uh, and talk about a little bit more generally about um, sources of alpha and, and their uncorrelated sources of alpha in the market. So uh, 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 Michael Mobison has this acronym, which I, which I like, uh, easier to remember, of the four independent sources of alpha in the market. And it's, the acronym is BAIT. So B is for behavioral. Uh, so basically, if I understand the behavior of the market, the behavior of people, fear and greed, which sloshes the market around, I can make money. And lots of quant investing is in this behavioral domain. We, we can talk about uh, uh, a little bit more as we go along. Uh, a is for analytical. So, um, and often in analytical in this context is analyzing financial statements, analyzing companies in more detail, putting them on a consistent uh, comparison basis so that I really see where, where the opportunities are in terms of real comparisons. And so you can have an analytical advantage and make alpha source of, as a source of alpha in the market. I is for informational. So if I know more information than you do, you know, and it's legal, <laughs> uh, not insider trading, then obviously I can uh, trade uh, 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 better than you in terms of knowing things about um, uh, companies in the, in the marketplace that you, that you don't know. And a lot of the data that we're gonna talk about is in the informational advantage uh, um, uh, source of alpha. And T is trading. So algorithmic trading and other methods for for uh, reducing friction in their process of actually doing trading. Um, and uh, so, so that is uh, T in bait. So we have B-A-I-T as these four sources of alpha. And, and largely the quants are in the B and the T category and the fundamental folks are in the uh, 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 A and I. The other thing is that uh, different types of uh, trading in the market actually have different timeframes. And so, um, and I'm going to uh, describe this initially in the context of, of data because I want to talk about data, uh, focus on data in, in this seminar. So, so let's just talk about data in different time frames, and then we can talk about how, um, how data is an informational advantage. So in the so different time frames. So so there, the shortest time frame is um, sort of a movement towards uh, high speed trading. So if I can build an AI system that actually knows things um, uh, either about price movement or in terms of data that actually can read um, news, can read um, uh, social media, can read analyst reports faster than you can. And it can predict uh, based upon sentiment or other things, how the market's going to react when this news becomes public. Then I have the opportunity, uh, so my computer fa reads faster than you do, it never sleeps. So I have the opportunity to front run you. So I can actually, uh, trade ahead of the reaction that the market's going to have and make money doing that. And it's a, a well-known fact that uh, Renaissance Technologies, one of the most successful quant funds uh, in existence, actually uh, uses uh, this type of strategy as one of, in Citadel, and there, um, there's a bunch of other companies in the space that actually use um, and, um, uh, parts of, um, of this general idea. Um, the second time frame for using data for investing is um, a quarterly earnings surprise. And so the one of which I was just talking about at 0.72. Now these guys, at, and mostly guys at 0.72, if they are 51% right at forecasting the direction of earnings surprise, they survive. If they're 55% right at forecasting the direction of earnings surprise, they make millions of dollars a year. So um, in the first quarter using data, and we're using data from the world to forecast, uh, to be able to, uh, actually it's not really forecasting, it's uh, what we're doing is we're now casting the historic quarter, which already ended a few weeks ago. So the data already exists. So it's uh, so we're using analysis to determine how that company really did in the in the final quarter, and even how it's done in the weeks since then, in order to predict the direction of earnings surprise. Um, and uh, the first quarter using data, we were 62% right, uh, which is very high um, uh, in in the industry. And so people have. Uh, continue in this process of using data for quarterly earnings is happening at a bunch of firms. Um, uh, and the third time domain for using data is actually using data uh, for longer than a quarter. And uh, what you're trying to do with the data is determine aspects of the health of the business that maybe the CEO doesn't even know. And certainly he's not telling you or he or she not, is not telling you in the, uh, in the, um, uh, in the quarterly report. Um, and there are things that are knowable about the business, which we'll talk about with some concrete examples, uh, which you can discover with data. And if you might be prepared to wait for the rest of the world to figure it out. 
And so this is almost like in the private equity uh, venture capital uh, domain of using, using data, but also happens in the public markets because essentially you're a longer term investor um, and you're trying to find the successful companies and uh, ignoring the mark to market pricing that's going on over time in order to actually take an advantage uh, later on. So, um, and one of the things I wanna talk about uh, in the seminar as we go along is that these methods of uh, fundamental investing and quant investing actually are completely uh, uncorrelated. And the best strategy is to have some of both of them. So let me just explain that uh, just for a, a one uh, brief example of that uh, before digging deeper into it. So one brief example of that is um, when you're analyzing, let's say trading, let's say event-based trading, like at 0.72, then one of the metrics for event-based trading is uh, is called a, is a hit ratio. So, um, uh, and they, they love uh, baseball analogies, um, rounders to you. Um, and uh, uh, the baseball analogy is um, what's your batting average? And so what fraction of the time are you right at forecasting the direction of surprise? So I was talking about that number before in the 52 to 55% range for most of these uh, uh, investors. Um, but the another really important number is the uh, slugging ratio. And so the slugging ratio in baseball analogy is when you hit the ball, uh, how hard do you hit it? <laughs> in other words, do you hit it over the fence? Um, and when you uh, and when you uh, don't hit the ball, um, how bad does it go? So, uh, so for example, Steve Cohen um, is a fantastic investor in terms of reading human psychology, which is the B in bait. Um, so that when he actually uh, it, when he's right, he makes more money than average, and when he's wrong, he loses less money than average. And so this is all about sort of uh, human intuition. Around, uh, around market dynamics and the trading process. And you can think of that as combining in some way, at least in his mind, um, the um, uh, discretionary knowledge of the fundamental knowledge of which companies should actually surprise, but also the B or human behavior, fear and greed knowledge about the way that markets react to this type of information in terms of maximizing your benefit. So what quants are trying to do is they're trying to write algorithms and methods which actually do the uh, B and the T part of uh, bait. Um, and what fundamental investors are trying to do is with spreadsheets, um, uh, do the uh, A and the I part of bait uh, in order to try to get advantage. And so what we really wanna talk about is how do you combine these two together with new data in order to actually build something that's better than either of them. And so, um, uh, and the way this has uh, been happening is that um, obviously uh, with this internet explosion and with all these data that are in the world and everyone's talking about it, everyone wants to find ways of actually incorporating those data into their processes. But again, a lot of this, this new third way of doing this is only, uh, only in, the, in the last few years sort of developing. And, and so, and there are lots of people who are doing it sort of in the poor man's version of it. So the poor man's version of, of it, if you're a fundamental person is to say, I need a data scientist. So I hire a data scientist straight out of college and I tell the data scientist um, to go and scrape the web, get me the magic number, and then I'm gonna manually type that magic number into my spreadsheet. So this is a fundamental person who's staying in their own wheelhouse and trying to actually act, still act like a fundamental investor, but trying to incorporate some new data from the world. And clearly that's not the right strategy. Uh, but similarly, quant investors have the, an equal uh, uh, sort of uh, bias. Um, so quant investors, so I have a friend uh, who teaches a, a two semester graduate class at uh, USC. He writes textbooks on, on um, fundamental investing and he has uh, like quant funds are paying them lots of money as an expert, um, uh, expert uh, um, advisor uh, to, and he asks, and he, he gets asked, you know, what, what ratio, what, what, what fundamental ratio should I incorporate into my, um, into my uh, quant model? And he wants to tell him, look, if I could reduce it to a single ratio, why do I have to teach a two semester graduate class? Because essentially quants don't necessarily want to understand fundamentals. They just want some advantage that they can actually put into their quant model. So the question is, what does this look like? So, so if I really combine the two together, what does this look like? And why is there alpha? And how much advantage uh, uh, could, I, could I get? Um, and um, so, so, so let's, um, so, so let's uh, uh, talk about um, uh, what it could really look like. In order to really talk, talk about what it could really look like, we have to think a little bit more about the way the success of quant investors, the success of fundamental investors, and where the opportunity really sets. 
And so, um, so I, I, again, when you talk to quant investors, they worry about uh, two things more than anything else. They worry about alpha decay, which is how quickly is my new alpha that I just found going to disappear? And they also worry about overcrowding, which is how many other people are actually have in their quant model this exact same thing uh, that they're trying to do. So you can think of um, quant um, uh, strategies as finding inefficiencies. I describe it as picking up shiny pebbles off the sand. It's just they're running around very quickly trying to find where these sort of shiny pebbles are that are actually really easy to get. Whereas fundamental investors are studying in great detail a small number of companies. So they're digging for gold with a shovel. And so they are, so uh, they're actually, you know, they're getting some depth into the process, but, but they're, pro they're using techniques which are, are, are not uh, computationally uh, uh, very, very powerful. And so there's lots of gold that's buried under the ground, <laughs> uh, but basically the quants aren't getting it because they're not getting deep enough and they're al always rushing around and the fundamental guys aren't getting it because they're using the wrong tool set. And so this new revolution in uh, investing, which is driven by data, is gonna be combining these methods in a way that allows um, the, uh, the real understanding of the businesses to actually uh, come about. So let me, let me now describe um, that in more detail. So, um, so, so let's, and the reason, we'll start with a fundamental investor because the fundamental investor really has some things that they know um, about, um, uh, about companies that the quants don't have. But, it's, but when the quants talk to them, it always sounds too, too much detail about one thing, but let's generalize it. So, so in every sector that fundamental investors look at, look at companies, they end up with what are called KPIs. There are some uh, things they want to measure about those companies, which allow them to, to get some uh, uh, approximate sense of the value of that company. And you can think about this in, you know, in our analogy to, 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 uh, to buying properties, it's you know how many rooms it has. There's some location stuff. There's the style of the building. You know there are all these KPIs or factors if you want in you know in buying properties. And similarly in buying stocks from a fundamental investor point of view, there are factors which actually change the valuation of the business. So you know, let's just take a very simple example of retail. So in retail, the two and most important factors are I describe it as how many money trees did you plant last year and how well are your money trees growing on average. So it's uh, new stores and same store sales. So same store sales is year over year change in the in growth of all of the revenue at your stores. And because they're entering data in a spreadsheet, uh, these numbers are, are all they're using is uh, sort of these, these single uh, descriptive numbers of the distribution. But, um, uh, but there's obviously lots of detail um, about that, the, those exact metrics, which is lost in that approximation. So let me just explain a couple of directions where the detail is missing, where we can actually now provide better detail and therefore make better decisions. So one way it's missing is in thinking about where the revenue comes from. So if I have a same store sales number, average growth of revenue, then, I, then you know that's good. But what I really want to do is forecast um, and uh, the net present value of what that revenue is going to look like over time. And I want to in, in, integrate that, add it up, sum it up, so that I actually can determine how much the um, how much the business is worth now. Um, and so, you know, people will just extrapolate, fit it to a line, and extrapolate. But that's not very good. So, with data, I can actually answer the question much more precisely. So, for example, let's say a company grows by five percent. The question is, how did it grow by five percent? So, it could grow by five percent at least in four completely different ways. And obviously lots of combinations of those different ways. So one way they could grow by 5% is getting 5% more customers. Well, that would be really good because those customers uh, bring a lifetime value to you, the expectation value of how much they'll pay you over time. Um, and you are only getting one payment, one increment of that lifetime value. So when a new customer comes to you, you can actually feel happy that they will continue to pay you until they they pay you the expectation value of their lifetime value. Well, that's great. Um, or you could get customers like at Starbucks to spend more money by having an app and reminding them to come back and so on and so forth. So that's more loyalty spend from the same customers. Now, if you get more, more loyalty spend from the same customers, you're using up the lifetime value potentially faster. It's a saturation function. It can't go on forever. It's a completely different forecast of what happens in the future if you're actually making money from uh, these loyalty payments. 
or I could raise the price of a coffee and actually lose some customers, in which case I only get paid once in this quarter and my, and my expectation in future quarters for how much I'm going to make uh, from these customers might decrease because of the fact that um, uh, I, you know, I'm disincentivizing some of my customers. And for example, Netflix, every time they raise their price, they lose a new tranche of customers and so that affects um, uh, your ability to predict um, where their, um, the, you know, the revenue uh, that is going to be in, in, in future years. Now, the best form, the fourth form of, of get, making 5% is actually selling to a whole new cohort of customers that weren't with you before. So a very simple example of this is uh, Lululemon. So they make yoga clothes. Initially, five years ago, they were making yoga clothes only for women. Now, five years ago, the CEO said, you know what, men are buying our yoga clothes. So we're gonna start making some styles and sizes for men. So when Lululemon breaks into a whole new cohort, you know, selling yoga clothes to men, their growth is going to actually be much faster than linear for at least a, a short period of time until they, until they, um, um, they gain a, a fixed percentage of that new cohort, and then it might slow down. And so your, your forecast for the future value of Lululemon um, is going to be a lot higher, um, given that they've actually started selling to a whole new cohort. So again, if I have data sets that allow me to break down the nature, in fact, to sum up the value of the business by the nature and characteristics of all the customers of that business using a computer, then basically then my ability to forecast the future revenue of that uh, business is much more precise than it would have been um, just with a discretionary investor using a spreadsheet. So let's take it another step. So let's go back to their same store sales. And so the same store sales is the mean growth per store. Well, some businesses are really good at selecting locations and setting up stores, in which case maybe the, the standard deviation of that distribution across all their stores is actually very small. But some businesses are really bad um, at um, uh, picking store locations. And so the mean might be a very bad uh, descriptive statistic of the distribution. And so, um, so with data, we can actually build the entire distribution. So we can actually see how well the whole set of all stores do for every stock, for every business. And we can do it simultaneously by just using this uh, computing. So it's essentially, we can actually increase the magnification or increase the resolution of exactly the questions that um, the discretionary investors were wanting to ask, but across um, the entire investable universe simultaneously. So, so what you can do is essentially build, so where a fundamental investor might build you know, uh, spreadsheet models for, for 30 to 100 companies and update them and monitor these companies carefully day by, uh, you know, throughout an, in full, a full-time job. Using a computer, we can actually build a large scale model in higher resolution of the entire investable universe at the same way, in fact, in more detail than a fundamental investor would, would do. Um, and, and, and be able to make um, uh, better decisions about the underlying uh, valuation of, uh, of these uh, of businesses. So, um, and so, 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 uh, so I've been talking in generality about this, uh, this idea, um, but let me talk uh, more specifically. So, so, so when we, um, so first of all, I can, I can, I can give, uh, if there's interest, a whole, lots of different examples of real investment uh, cases where uh, lots of money has been made by doing this type of analysis on individual stocks and individual names. And so and a lot of what I've done in the last seven years is actually uh, uh, helping investors who have a specific thesis and gaining in the, the data, which would actually help them test and evaluate their thesis uh, and get some alpha advantage of, uh, uh, for that investment. And I, again, I have a, lots of examples of that. But, the, but what I'm doing now is actually doing that at scale across the whole investable universe. Uh, because it turns out that the KPIs uh, by sector are largely the same, the methods are largely the same, and the data sets are largely the same. So a large fraction of this actually can be done simultaneously across um, all the stocks. So, so, so imagine if you have, instead of having you know, 30 uh, 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 financial models, you have uh, 4,000 financial models, which are actually are more granular. Then you can ask questions of um, which companies have the most exposure to interest rate changes, uh, which companies um, have the most opportunity to growth 
in terms of the incremental, uh, the profit they get uh, for for incre for for uh, divided by the expense they, they need to, to make to, to grow the business a little bit. So where is the opportunity for growth? Who has the most turns of debt? And, you know, all sorts of questions you can ask you know, about competitive dynamics of, of these businesses and so on and so forth. And so, so essentially by building um, uh, 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 quantitative analysis type processes, but actually which are much more, uh, which, which are tailored to the fundamental characteristics of the business um, instead of actually just tailored to the, uh, just looking for the, uh, looking for uh, the uh, uh, easy sources of, uh, easier sources of alpha. So, so let, me, let me try to make this comparison a little bit more clear in terms of quant versus fundamental. So I'll, I'll give you an example of a data set. And so also, Happy to chat, um, answer questions about these data sets and what type of data there are and how these data are used. Um, and a lot of the, the tricks are actually in how you process the data. Um, and there's lots of machine learning methods involved in this too. Happy to talk about those. But let me just give you an example and to try to con contrast this point, the point I'm trying to make about how fundamental um, investors think versus how quants think about the same data set. So one data set, which both types of investors like um, is, um, uh, um, is Glassdoor. So, uh, so Glassdoor is obviously a website where employees can actually either praise their business or they can criticize their business. And so it really isn't very good. If your employees are all criticizing the business, it's not, not a particularly good um, uh, for the business. And in fact, you know, firms are now hiring PR firms to try to, uh, to try to, um, uh, help uh, manage their glass door image, um, you know, uh, uh, in whatever ways you might imagine that happens. But let's just talk about quants versus fundamentals for a moment. So, um, so a quant says, okay, look, um, I have a whole model. It has lots of different data sets in it, and the and um, but um, glass door looks interesting. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to take the glass door data, I'm going to um, uh, normalize it, remove outliers, I'm sorry, remove outliers, then normalize it, and then I'm going to uh, take the uh, the top quintile of Glassdoor ratings and go long, and the bottom quintile of Glassdoor ratings and go short, ignore the middle uh, three, and I'll back test it over time and see if I use this as a strategy, if I would have made money um, in the market against all these companies that have Glassdoor ratings. And um, you make a little bit of alpha. And then the second thing you do as a quant investor is you say, okay, um, now that I, may, I see that this actually generates a lot of alpha, I have to see if it's already um, um, incorporated into all the other signals that I've built into my quant model. So I look to see if it's, um, if it's um, correlated or uncorrelated with my existing um, uh, uh, aggregate sort of uh, investing uh, process. If it's uncorrelated, then it's supplemental um, uh, alpha. And then I, you know, like a good quant, I didn't shred it and put it in the soup and stir the soup around and it basically it's all mixed together and I'm, I'm now using a glass door. I'm done. Now, fundamental investors look at this completely differently. They say, look, um, what I really care about is my company. I, you know, I follow this company and all of a sudden it's glass door ratings have gone down. So they might take a few companies they care about that had good Glassdoor ratings in the past. Uh, now they put that have poor Glassdoor ratings and they look at what's changed in the stock price over that time. They look at you know, what the CEO said, if there are management changes and so on and so forth. And they get some sense of what the internal dynamics of the company are that sort of lead to over what course of time to changes in Glassdoor ratings. So they actually have a deeper understanding of this Glassdoor rating signal because they're studying it more detail in terms of like its time course and so on and so forth, so that they can understand um, when uh, you know when to react given that there's a change in Glassdoor rating. Um, and so the thing is that the combination would actually take the knowledge that the fundamental folks have about what the time course is of the impact of Glassdoor ratings and some filtering processes and relevant characteristics of Glassdoor ratings, which would require you to understand some things about the business. And it would actually build a signal that's based upon that, which would be more robust in, in combination also with its financial statements, instead of just you know, random signals uh, uh, that are thrown into in, in the in the soup that actually just looks for anything changing, leading to a change in trading. So the the uh, uh, fundamental process is built upon a model of the company's operation, um, and the quant model is based simply on um, uh, a, uh, a a a tracking of the price change, um, and um, and the price change is uh, of course much more random 
than the uh, than the 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 the, 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 the the change. One way of thinking about that is that if you think about uh, 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 financial uh, sorry uh, foreign exchange, um, so uh, the the exchange rate between any two countries um, is going to in the long term is going to be determined by the relative GDP growth of the two countries. You know, one country grows a lot, you know, its currency essentially is gonna become more valuable in, you know, all thing else, everything else remaining, remaining unchanged. Um, but of course the uh, short-term um, uh, uh, currency uh, exchange rates are just driven by lots of fluctuations in, in market sentiment. And so, um, so, so, so these two, these two, two, two worlds. Again, one of them is much more long-term and much more fundamental-based. Um, and there are only there are certain regimes in the market where fundamental investing is actually useful. And of course, it's not a trading strategy by itself. Knowing the valuation of a company, it's a com it's a component of a trading st strategy. Um, so uh, anyway, so I so I was hoping to actually pause a lot more, and I've noticed time has gone by. So let me. Um, let me just pause now, and I'm happy, and I'm happy to elaborate some things. Uh, in, in see if there see if there are any questions. I covered a fair bit of uh, sort of at least um, framing um, in uh, the in this initial sort of 20 25 minutes, and I want to sort of dig deep into some examples, either of data or of uh, companies or of methodology. But I want to see. Um, uh, it's it's difficult with uh, without a room full of people and faces to look at to see if, uh, to, uh, whether this is making sense. So let me let me pause and, and see if I can take a few questions and I can happy to go on from there. Thank you, Michael. Yes, it's a, probably it's a good time for questions. Um, yeah, I guess, I guess now there would be time for questions uh, mainly uh, and for the next uh, 15, 20 minutes we have time uh, for questions. Uh, I don't know if you have a uh, other part of the presentation after yeah. that, but we roughly allocate one hour in total for the seminar, not, not more. Okay, not just for you to know. Um, all right, so I think Alexander has activated video, so maybe it was about to ask, uh, ask a question. I don't know. Hi, uh, first Hi. and foremost, thanks a lot, Michael. That was really interesting. Very Super interesting. I um, have background in medicine, uh, so greetings from Sweden. Um, I kind of have a set of questions uh, in relation to the process, how you actually do these assessments, because um, I do quantitative analysis, uh, analysis of the price action most of the time. So actually, the fundamentals part has always been missing, and you know, I usually do that manually, applying like you know traditional models like VSIM, CanSlim, GARP. So I was just wondering how you do that practically, whether you also combine that with more traditional methods of fundamental analysis, like value analysis, you know, like applying these models in a more quantified way, um, instead of just kind of setting them manually in ThinVis. So that's that's the, the question I wanted to ask. Yeah. Thanks. So, so let me tell you. So I have a. Uh, I'll tell you a very quick story about a data vendor. So I have a data vendor. Um, they're actually called uh, Canalyst, Canadian Analyst, uh, and they're in Vancouver. And what they do is they provide spreadsheet models to fundamental investors. So most fundamental investors build their own spreadsheet models, they're all bespoke, and that they want to compare it to some sell-side model, they can't because they don't line up. They send it to India or somewhere, someone lines it up for them. So Canalyst says, look, just start with our boilerplate, and here's an overlay mechanism so you can add your differentiated view and you just push a button and all the new numbers are actually put there. We have, you know, 200 analysts who actually go and, you know, uh, go and check these things to make sure they're, they're okay. And they, they provide that as a service. Now, five years ago, they said, gee, you know, maybe some quants want this. And so some quants said, yeah, I want this ratio. I want that ratio. I said to the CEO, we want everything. In JSON format, all 4,000 spreadsheets. Uh, and the first thing we did was we wrote a small spreadsheet program, which compared the number in the cell to what the formula said should be there. And we found a few hundred errors. So we sent those errors to the, to the company and they said, oh my God, you can do this. We'll keep sending you the data for free if you just QA it for us. So now I have 4,000 models in JSON format and a spreadsheet program. And so all these models go down to telling me what the price of the stock should be and what the valuation of the company is. And I can tweak any parameter in the financial model I want. And guess what? They're updating them for free for me every quarter when it never comes out. And so that is the starting point. I call it building Zillow for the stock market. Because again, if I want to value a company, I go to an expert or I can look at Zillow for the freeze estimate of the, of the property. So why not start with what the fundamental folks have in all the, de the, the glory detail and then elaborate that in more detail than they do so that you can actually understand the business and have it updated automatically, both with your alternative data like credit card and other transactions, as well as 
um, uh, by all, all the other sources that you might that you might have. Hmm. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Michael. Um, I had a question. I was wondering about how you get all this data. Um, is it kind of just Chase and credit cards? What happens if people are there and they're not spent, they don't bank with Chase? Um, then where are you getting it? And it, it just feels like there's always more data. Just is it necessarily tracked? And maybe in the future it will be. But I walked past Lululemon on the weekend. There was a big queue. If you had access to the CCTV, you might be able to see that there was a big queue. That, but well, would you? Are you going to get that? data from the council I, I don't know so it just seems that a lot of this in data is quite hard to get and that's probably why it's not in the market and that's where the edge comes in well so so the answer to the question is uh it's actually relatively easy to get if you know where to get it so uh, so uh, so, so um uh, you probably in the uk you've heard of the network called three um so um so three network um all the location of those uh, three network phones is sold by ck delta um, and um, CK Delta, you know, like all these other data vendors, are challenged to try to find how do I sell this into the market. Um, and you know, the way I describe this, so I left the buy side, and um, you know, it's like leaving the government. All the lobbyists want to hire you, so I left the. And so all of these data vendors, they they basically, you know, also uh, thank you AWS have given me infinite free compute. Um, so I have um, a some infrastructure in the cloud. All these data vendors just load the data in the cloud uh, for me with, at zero cost. Uh, because I'm helping them build new channels for selling their data. And so a quick example of, uh, so if the weather's nice, people go shopping. If I have cell phone locations, I know they went shopping. <laughs> if I have credit card transactions, I know how much they spent. So credit card transactions are generally the best. Uh, quick story around credit card transactions. So uh, when I went to Point72, they were buying a panel of credit card transactions. Now there's a, companies that do infrastructure support for banks. So it's not buying it from Chase. It's actually, they're providing infrastructure for all these banks and they get a copy of the data for free. So one of these companies, the first mover in this space is called Yodley. They're in Redwood City. Um, and they basically, um, so they get uh, data from uh, lots of banks and they sell it. So when I got to point 72, they were buying this data. It was a, a one and a half percent of US credit card spend, about 4 million card holders. Um, the cost was about million and a half um, uh, a year, which is a lot. Um, uh, but I wanted more and they were badly sampling the data. And so we bought everything they had. I can't tell you the price, but it was a very large seven digit number. Um, and, um, and so when, but when I got into my new business, I said, look, I want the same data. I'll pay you maybe a half a million. They laughed at me like, why would we ever do that? I said, well, here's why. You're gonna delay it by a month because all of these asset managers and, uh, and PE firms and stuff don't wanna compete with the, the big hedge funds for price. And they don't care if it's a month delayed. Uh, and so uh, I helped them build a new channel for selling their product. And now we have a lot of this credit card data for free because I'm helping build other channels for these vendors. So it turns out the data is really easy to get because the vendors are trying to find the pathway into the market because they don't know how to sell it. Um, and they don't know what the use cases are. And so if you help them with the use cases, they will gladly let you um, have access to their data um, uh, uh, for free. And there's just use advantage. The other thing is the largest source of data, which you know, university uh, folks have access to, which lots of funds will worry with, about compliance is scrape data from the web. There's so much information on the web about everything. Um, and, you know, I see these analyst reports where they're talking about, gee, we're surprised about this. I said, I'm not surprised at all because you can scrape that information straight from the websites. So, um, so there's still lots of analysts who don't know how to go and get the data uh, from scraping online, who are completely surprised who are leading analysts for stocks when the data is actually just right there and available just for a little bit of scraping. Uh, hello, Michael. Can I ask you a question for you, Michael? Is, yeah, in fact, is um, for for the fundamentals, you know, the the long term investor usually they know they use the fundamentals, follow the company for a while, you know, know the, the company well before they know uh, doing some uh, you know uh, significant investment and keep usually the shares for long time, like five, 10, 20 years, and uh, and in the quantitative side. I think uh, it is more short term or even instantaneous. Okay, so I don't know uh, if in the quantitative side we try to predict predict something for the next three, four, even five years. I think it's quite hard. And how do, can we combine this two? You know, what is more long term? I say even more than ten. And yeah. you know, me, I'm I'm a quant. Uh, 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 um, uh, 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 pricing options. So I know that this is, is, is we don't have really 
in mind uh, the long term. So how to combine this with uh, some long term, uh, more fundamentalist uh, investor? Yeah, so um, so the answer is that, uh, well, so fundamental investors, I mean, the PE firms, uh, VC firms might actually invest for five years or more like that, or 10 years. But but basically most ones, even PE firms, it's like three years and I need to see some result, right? And so um, the, um, uh, and, and, and the fundamental investors like they're trading on earnings surprise, it's one quarter, right? And so, um, and, the, and the example I was trying to give uh, with earnings surprise, so let's say I know, uh, let's say I know 62% right, my batting average in terms of predicting the direction of earnings surprise. So then the question is, uh, it's a market dynamics question. So, you know, um, if I draw a rock into a, into, a, into a pond, there are some ripples that occur. And those ripples are relatively predictable in terms of the way the market's going to react when, depending upon the, on, the, on the volume, as well as the amount of these ripples that actually occur in the, in, in the market. And so, you know, so as I was saying in my example, Steve Cohen, for example, is super good at being able to read um, the way, you know, the way the market's going to react. So when this reaction happens, either it's surprise up or surprise down, if you actually can trade manually in and out of that, then you can actually maximize your advantage. But if a person can do it, a computer can do it too. So, so you could train a computer so that it trains, it trades on the surprise. Initially, where the batting average is determined by data, but the dynamics of the way you trade in terms of uh, liquidity and so on and so forth, in terms of the way that the price is moving, um, then are based upon um, an algorithmic process, which is actually a completely quant. You know, and, you know, and, so, and so I think that you know, that's an example of how you uh, combine it together. Another example is, you know, um, what, do you, what do you do? So what um, people who trade on events often do is they don't want any market risk. They only want to position their bet right before the print of the new earnings. And so what happens in the rest of the quarter? Well, the rest of the quarter, there's also lots of things going on with the stock, which are actually shorter term dynamics of the stock. And so you can use the money. So, so these, these quarterly uh, event-based traders, they get out immediately. They get in right before the event, they get out right after the event. And so during the interval between the events, they could be using quant strategies to actually um, uh, benefit from other market fluctuations that are occurring outside of these uh, data-driven uh, surprise uh, movements that occur um, in the earnings process. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I think uh, Alexander has another question. For all people that are asking questions, keep in mind that this is recorded. So and so, I would like to ask your your permission to uh, upload online after the seminar. So so if that's all right. Um, so Alexander, do you have another question? Yeah, it's a quick one. Uh, okay, I was just wondering, do you see a lot of value in? Um, social media scrapping, because um, I've been experimenting that a little bit with paper trades with some mixed results. And so, I mean, it doesn't really fit my trading style. So usually, you know, this is, it seems to me like more of a lagging indicator, but I just find it interesting to follow. And um, I was just curious whether you see much value in that and do you use that in your strategies? Yeah, so I think the, uh, I mean, obviously uh, the, the big challenge with almost all data sets, and certainly this is true, in spades with social media is it's all power law Pareto sort of distributed. So you end up with some people, you know, tweeting a lot or posting a lot and so on and so forth. And, and so I, so I think there's lots of uh, this strategy, which involves in how do you, uh, how do you leverage a data source, source, which actually has this power law characteristics. Um, um, but again, the other thing I would say about social media is it's in the in the B category, not in the A or I category. So you can see it's sort of informational, but largely it's a behavioral thing. It's a sentiment type of signal. So, so it's more of a quant related uh, uh, contribution than it is informational. So, but there is an informational. So, so people will tweet that I've just, you know, I'm, you know, you can get some demand for, for a product, which could be a leading indicator. So we also look at Google trends and other things like that, which are sort of brand awareness. So if you look for, someone searches for a category like batteries, they don't really care. If they search for energizer, they care about that particular brand. And so there's some brand awareness that you can get also from social media stuff. And, you know, and lots of uh, businesses are driven by the relative difference between the generic uh, cost and the cost that, the, for their brand. And, um, and a lot of that's eroding, by the way, for a whole bunch of brands, whereas some brands still have a mystique, you know, Energizer is one of them, 
people be still believe in the Energizer Bunny. Um, and so, so there's some mystique that's associated with it. And so you want to track that. Um, so, so I think that there is definitely information from, um, from uh, uh, social media, but it's not as valuable as, you know, job listings, uh, job postings, um, you know, cell phone location, you know, uh, credit card transactions, you know, uh, shipping and stuff like that, which are supply chain indications. So again, mostly what I'm interested in is uh, real measures of sort of ground truth. Yeah. And just to say one more quick word about it is, you know, you know, one of the things that fundamental folks are really good at, they say you can't replicate, is that they can read the body language of the CEO. And so fundamental folks, well, they want some data so they can ask hard questions, because if the CEO is cagey about it, then they, they sort of know what's true and what's not true. And there's this great book about Google Trends called Everybody Lies. So what they tell a survey is one thing, what they tell, type, when they type in Google is another thing. The same thing happens with CEOs. So a CEO says they're gonna have a great quarter, but what's their hiring look like compared to last time they said that? You know, what are these other factors compared to, compared to last time they said it? So you can sort of have this combination of what they're saying and what you're seeing in the data as a measure of whether, uh, you know, what's underlying, which is sort of what, one of the skills of discretionary investors in terms of talking to management, management access. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Um, I, I just wanted to quickly ask, what, how long do you think this is going to last for this informational edge that you say that you managed to get the price down to quite cheap for the original data set uh, in that example you gave? Uh, surely people are waking up to this. I mean, the credit card data is now, is now just used as a, a, in the same way that kind of labor market data from the government is used that the banks have it and they use it in their process surely everyone is now going to be tapping into this how long is this edge going to last do you think uh well so i, I guess i disagree with the premise uh, but i'll answer the question so the, the so the thing is that um the the problem is that in the finance industry uh computing the you know the they have it they don't have engineering so IT is fix my fix my uh, email, you know, put a phone jack here, write this piece of code. Engineering is what you have in internet internet space where they're actually doing creative engineering to go build this stuff. And so the, even though they have some of the data, they don't necessarily have the methods, uh, the technology stack in order to process the data in such a way in order to get maximum benefit out, out of it. And so um, so so I think that you know well it's you know a by analogy you know transactions of I'm sorry the uh, transcripts and the you know the regulatory reports have been there forever but new methods in, in natural language processing are now finding new alpha for quants in analyzing these things that have been there for decades and so similarly these new methods for analyzing these data sets are actually uh, generating alpha so the alpha is going to be there a, a very long time um, because it's just really more of a more of a question of the detail of the way that the Data is actually being uh, being processed. And again, if you want to just keep track, you can just say to yourself, okay, until the earnings surprise, the sum of the absolute value across the market of the earnings surprise goes to zero, then there's value in information because until we're not surprised at all, <laughs> um, until we're not surprised at all when we see the uh, when we see the uh, company's earnings, then basically the information is still uh, not out there. It's not in the market. Thank you again. Uh, we have three minutes, uh, so I don't, there's space for I guess for another question. Oh, there is a question actually in the chat. For so you have, do you have any data protection challenge to obtain the data set? Because every country has different policies. Uh, I wonder how would you solve this problem? Yeah. So um, so the thing is that um, this is a a, a very um, it's a good question, but it's one that comes up all the time. You know, we have. Uh, you know, uh, GDPR, we've got um, all these things going on in terms of like uh, privacy protections and so on. The answer is that, um, I, you know, I described, some people call this alternative data. I actually call it, you know, digital residue because it's really the leftover of inexpensive electronics, which is everywhere. And um, so, um, you know, and it's a slippery slope. So, you know, before people were using data, they might hire someone to stand outside a store with a, with a thumb wheel all day long at minimum wage and count how many people go in the store. And now you're just doing something uh, with an, another data set to go and process it. And so, you know, as the regulations, you know, try to actually stop various forms of data uh, uh, for, to protect privacy, there just become other ways for the same data to come out. So for example, you know, go back to web scraping. The data is just online. Um, and if someone in their dorm room can go scrape it and build a model and actually get some alpha out of it, there's no way to regulate it, um, you know? And so it's, um, 
uh, you know, you can regulate existing institutions which have licenses to go and build training systems, but you, it's very hard to, to, to regulate what someone can do with their own trading strategy by just writing code um, online. So I think that the, and there's so many ways to actually see the same thing on data that, um, uh, that uh, I, I really don't think uh, that uh, regulations are going to stop the uh, flow of, of data into uh, market and trading strategies.